Good afternoon and welcome to the third of our distinguished lectures, third of our lectures in the distinguished lecture series of the ISR for the year 2005-2006. And today we have with us Professor Shankar Shastri of the University of California, Berkeley, who several of us on the faculty know very well. In fact, I overlapped with him as a graduate student in Berkeley back in the early 1980s, late 1970s, 79 to 80 or so. Uh, in 1980, he left Berkeley with his PhD and went to MIT, joined the faculty there for a couple of years before he went to Berkeley again. Since I know Shankar so well, I, just, I didn't write notes uh, to introduce him uh, until the very last minute. And then I got writer's cramp when I was writing down his biography. <laughs> so, so I uh, would like to tell you some things about him. He's the director of the Center for Information Technology and the Interest of Society, or Citrus at UC Berkeley. He's also the NEC Distinguished Professor of EECS and Professor of Bioengineering at UC Berkeley. He was the Chair of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from 2001 to 2004. Before that, he was the Director of Information Technology Office at DARPA. So he knows the Washington area pretty well. Uh, from 1996 to 1999, he was the Director of Electronics Research Laboratory at Berkeley. He has a slew of research areas I remember when we were graduate students, I was telling him, you're, you're, you've got so much energy. And he says, oh, you haven't seen anything. I've actually slowed down since I was an undergraduate at IIT. At that time, I had unbounded energy. And in fact, I think his energy has just kept on increasing without bounds ever since then. So his research areas include embedded in autonomous software, computer vision, computation in novel substrates such as DNA, nonlinear and adaptive control. In fact, his uh, foundation is in control theory and system Robotic telesurgery, control of hybrid systems, embedded systems, sensor networks, biological motor control, and these are just a few of the areas that he's worked in or is working in right now. I know he's also done a lot of work in areas like swarming, vehicle dynamics, and so on. Uh, he's, his PhD, like I mentioned, was from the University of California, Berkeley, in 1981. Uh, besides being at MIT from 80 to 82, he was also the Gordon McKay Professor at Harvard. In 1994, he's published over 250 papers and authored or co-authored six books and edited some other number of volumes. He was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 2000 for pioneering contributions to the design of hybrid and embedded systems. He received the President of India Gold Medal in 1977. Uh, I think that's given for the top-ranking graduate of the IIT. Uh, he received the IBM Practice Development Award for the period 1983 to 1985, and a set presidential investigator award in 1985. The Ecton Award of the American Automatic Control Council in 1990. He was elected like, fellow of the League in 1994. One of his major contributions, I think, to <coughs> learning is that he's taught and graduated over 45 PhD students who are placed in very good universities and positions throughout the country and the world. Uh, you know, I, like I said, I got writer's cramp writing all of this. Uh, Shankar has been an amazing contributor to control systems, applications, uh, in all kinds of areas. He's had an impact in a lot of his application areas, as well as in his home field of control theory. And he's also proven himself to be a great leader of departments and centers, uh, and in the government and university and so on. And it's really a pleasure to have him here with us. Vanderbilt, 
it's uh, actually pretty anecdotal in the University of Memphis. These are the faculty involved. Um, you know, the folks in black are Berkeley, the folks in uh, orange are Vanderbilt, and uh, green is Memphis. Uh, Claire's at Stanford as well as Berkeley, and that's why she got on is in red. Okay, so I think that uh, it's actually a very exciting time to put together what we call our uh, theory of next generation systems, which is. Uh, to put together a kind of systems theory for supporting the embedded systems. So embedded systems are systems that are, that are computer, computing devices are embedded in the physical world and interact with the physical world. That's what one means by embedded systems. And roughly speaking, the agenda consists of taking information technology and putting it into old economy sectors. And so this agenda, that's sort of a lot of where the physical systems lie there, and transportation, and cars, and so on and so forth. So the agenda of taking it there is really sort of the agenda of the center. Uh, it's, been in, in, it's been in action for a few years. The mission really is to, I, you know, this is my colleague Edward Lee, who I guess has been here as well, has uh, talked about, uh, uh, you know, the problem has been that if you, while you compute, you only think about best effort rather than timing guarantees. Uh, bad things happen. And computers, uh, which interact with physical processes, don't pay attention to timing uh, properties that are associated with physical systems. So the big thing, big, in addition to the fact that they need to be fault tolerant, robust, secure, you know, in systems like this, where the dependent software is correct, is that the physical world the word crash is more than a metaphor. You know, it's, quite frequently something that's made real and life limbs involved. But the, the, the way we've talked about this is, and I was really gratified to listen to Rance this afternoon, it's very much this sense that writing software should be model-based. In the sense that in everything else in engineering, you have a model of what you'd like to do, a mathematical model of what you'd like to do, and that abstraction gives rise to a specific implementation. So we've tried to push these model-based design techniques for writing embedded software. And the rest of the issue is about generating tools. So the agenda about tools, I'll talk to you a little bit about this. The issue here is that we want to get human beings out of the business of writing software. That's one way to get them to be a little, uh, a little less, a little more, little more bug-free. And the way to do this is to really try to understand how to let designers design at a relatively high level of abstraction. In order to let them do that, you've got to produce the tool chain, which goes from higher levels of abstraction right down to mapping onto code that and then code that lives in the processes. So those are the, sort of the two mantras for the center model-based design and embedded systems. And along the way, I think it's been a very interesting agenda in that we found it so a caricature that's sometimes made of uh, EECS departments is that excuse me. Uh, it's made of EECS departments is that so sort of, uh, the EE guys do the hardware and the CS guys do the software. And that's just really broken. So I think that one of the things we've got to do is to really start thinking a little more abstractly about systems. And to be a little more critical of our own systems theory, I think that we're a little too uh, plunged into the details of linear and nonlinear without thinking abstractly about what one means by systems. Because the kinds of systems that one encounters when one thinks about tool chains are systems which have multiple models of computation, the finite state machines, the differential equations, the data flow architectures, and all of them are thrown in together. To be able to translate models from one framework to another enables you, is really what's required here. And that's what we mean by this uh, new system science. Uh, I'll tell you what it means to be both simultaneously computational and physical. So who cares? Uh, you know, it's a long time since I was at DARPA, but I guess you're all still prey to these Heilmeier questions about who cares if you're successful. Uh, so, uh, I, I think that the issues, certainly, at the time we began, it's still true that DOD systems are still the uh, military systems are really the biggest stakeholder where and everybody has the same metal, rubber, and glass. It's sort of what's inside the software that actually makes a difference. And these are some examples of where it's been important. I think, on the other hand, the big battles are really in the automotive sector, whereby 
lot of standards, you know, a lot of the cost of new cars, especially in the high-end cars, and those gradually translate into all the other cars. A lot of the components of uh, a car are embedded software. And the issues, by the way, just to give you a sense, is that so in some of the BMW 7 series, there are 70 odd processors on a car, and it's, somehow this seems wasteful. You, know, you, you could get by with a lot less, but the reasons that you have so many processors is because uh, the philosophy of acquisition of the automotive industry has been by functionality, you know, so you get one part with one processor. And the problem about putting them all together is without thinking about interactions, you can have bizarre things like uh, having people step on the brakes and uh, CD jumping out of the CD player. Uh, this is actually a documented case which results in recalls which are really expensive. So the reason, so auto, auto, auto manufacturers need to have a lot more embedded software because that's what sells cars. So just to give you examples, uh, you know, the OnStar system is really one of the, uh, the biggest consumer of wireless minutes in this country. And the biggest news of that is uh, people who need their car doors unlocked. You know, that's, uh, so, so people need these features, but at the same time, it's too expensive for an auto manufacturer to recall cars because of unknown interactions. So you've got to be able to design these systems correctly right from the beginning. And of course, what I think is coming is uh, these ubiquitous computing devices. Uh, certainly there's a lot of activity on sensor webs, also the evolution of mobile phones, but even such prosaic devices as television sets. You know, a lot of the cost of a television set is software. And there are all kinds of wonderful statistics from Philips and others about how much of the cost of producing software of these things shows up in software. And finally, uh, the least glamorous but the most prevalent of them all are physical infrastructure controlled by these systems which are known by this arcane term of SCADA DCS, which stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. And DCS actually just means digital control system. So this is what controls oil, gas, water, electric power, all of this stuff. So this physical infrastructure is all vulnerable. It needs to be changed. And some version of this would probably be a, wireless infrastructure and a secure wireless infrastructure, it also needs to be designed to do distributed control. So that, that is, so these are all the places where I think uh, embedded software really matters. So in this center, we've actually worked on a diversity of these applications. It's been pretty important to pay attention to TAD socks, fuel injection. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, more about the drivetrain. We've done a little bit of UAVs. I'll talk about this. These are these famous Berkeley moats. It's an experiment using 500 odd moats. And amazingly, the kind of theory that goes into thinking about embedded software is, is really quite evocative for thinking about uh, the dynamics of gene protein networks and protein protein networks. And that's this uh, type of uh, systems biology. Um, so that's what we've done. So the, the approach in the project has been. Uh, so this notion about a view from the top and a view from the bottom, and just, it's uh, my colleague Alberto Santuani calls this uh, platform-based design, so we just sort of demystify it. So the notion is that you can build complex systems two ways, either from the bottom up, in which case, uh, if you have a lot of components and everybody does their design for each one of them, the overall design is inelegant and has code, which is spaghetti code, because you know there's different pieces in different application, you got to stick them together. That's sort of what the current cars look like. Uh, the problem about design from the top is if you do a top-down design without paying attention to what you're implementing it on, then of course you may be asking for, you might be asking for things which the components cannot put together, you may not be able to synthesize the components to put these two together. So what we try to do in this uh, platform-based design is to sort of uh, top down means bottom up is really sort of the philosophy that goes into this. And so the notion for going from top down is to build abstractions as you move up the uh, move up to different software chains. Not a lot, not unlike in hardware. You know, in hardware there's been a pretty good sense of being able to build abstractions that people can write software on top of. Here we're trying to do the same thing for hardware as well. The, the, the proviso that as you build abstractions, you expose key resource limitations, chiefly timing constraints, but perhaps memory constraints, and so on and so forth, and highly inessential implementation constraints. 
And of course, the model-based design is one which allows the designer to be able to, to reason in as, uh, in, as, uh, in as abstract a framework as possible, and to be able to do so in a way that's as mathematically correct as possible. So you really want to take the pressure off testing of designs once they're built. Because the current culture is really one of testing until the money runs out. You know, that's sort of how current software designs are better. So you want to sort of take, take the pressure off that. And in this project, the, even though we, what I'll do for a bulk of the talk is to talk about the theory and sort of where the theory has gone, could go, should go, etc. Really, the concrete products of this project have been tools. The notion being that unless you give people tools that they can, that can interoperate and so on, it's way hard for people to really appreciate what the theory is. And of course, just writing tools is not good enough unless you can uh, elevate tools to the status of publication. So we're trying to uh, change that into the software tools. So I went through this before about key properties. It's, it's all about real-time systems, so reactive systems, heterogeneous systems. Also, networking. The problem with networking is sort of best effort. Networking doesn't always work with. Uh, and here's a little more about this. So I want to dive into the rest of the theory in a, in a, in a bit. The uh, so I just want to give you an example. So in this uh, story, what we've done just in the last four or five years, I just this is what I want to get to, is just put forward a number of tools. And these tools, so this is a. Uh, there's a modeling environment out of Handelville that's a model transformation environment. So to be able to build a tool chain, see different people write mark with different tools for different models. And then to be able to have these tools all interoperate, you've got to be able to translate precisely, semantically, correctly from one model to another. So both GME and GRADE are tools which enable you to do this model transformation or model translation. Of course, in things like MATLAB and so on, you've got to be in simulate, you've got to be careful about what the semantics are and to make sure that they're precise before you translate them. If they're not already precise, you've got to declare what it is before you translate it. Uh, John Comasaccio is a time trigger system coming out of Berkeley, told me it's a simulation system for hybrid systems. So hybrid systems are mixed models of computation. I'll talk about a class of them. High visual is again a simulation system, hybrid systems. Metropolis is a model transformation tool that comes from my colleague. Hyper is a, uh, is a what, is, what we call a hybrid system tool interchange format to just allow different tools to interoperate. And Mescal is a little more at the lower level. So everything about all these tools that are available for sort of download, free download, etc., by the, the new standard sort of Berkeley licenses, that's the rest of the dissemination of this. There's a long tradition in Berkeley of Spice and free download of tools and so on and so forth. And it's very much in keeping with this. So we do think, like, just like there was Spice, you know, there is a market for electronic design automation tools for embedded systems. Exactly what that is hasn't shaken out yet. Exactly who made money off it has certainly not been shaken out yet. But we do think that there, that's, there is a business angle. And I think our colleagues at the University of Maryland think so as well. And they have companies that create the systems prove it. So, right. So having said this, let me now tell you a little bit about my own work on hybrid systems. And I just want to acknowledge uh, really quite a few generations of students which are in different colors here. Uh, that's sort of one of the reasons for the colors in talking about hybrid systems. So I'll just dive in a little bit. What are hybrid systems? So hybrid systems are, in, in, in their most abstract form, they're layers of different models of computation. The simplest layering of two models of computation that one can think of is uh, automata, which are these uh, uh, finite state machines, and continuous time systems. So Q1, Q2, Q3 is an automaton. There are transitions between all three of these states that we have shown them. There's uh, differential equations, which, so Y is the state, let's say it follows one differential equation here, a different, a possibly different differential equation in there. The transitions between them are governed by these things called guards. So guard is a Boolean valued expression going from Q1, Q2, those two states. The exogenous input V uh, uh, and Q. And so uh, Q1, Q2, and V, when this when the state Y, when this guard evaluates that Y belongs to a region where this guard evaluates to true, then the transition is enabled. And 
when the transition is enabled, there is possibly a reset in this value of y. Um, also, another, another thing called an invariant tells you that uh, unless y satisfies another Boolean value variable, unless this invariance evaluates to true, the transition is forced out of the system. So if this thing evaluates to true, you're allowed to stay in the state q1. If it evaluates to false, you're forced to take this transition. So you know these transitions are invariant. If it's false, it's a forced transition, and that's an enabled transition. So there's some asymmetry between that. There's some quibbling in the literature about whether this should be symmetric, but uh, those are some niceties. So the reasons for doing this, of course, is that uh, you know the, the, the executions, which is the time trajectories of these systems, have a continuous part. Continuous part may have jumps at these jump values, and the discrete values, of course, may be like this. Uh, those are uh, values one, two, and three in this example, and those are the jump types. So the hybrid systems, certainly even this model, so the very simple class of hybrid systems, you know, it is in, uh, data flow and differential equations, you know, they can mix and match many, many different kinds of models, but even just this one models. Uh, you know, a lot of very different kinds of systems. Continuous systems with phased operations, continuous systems controlled by discrete inputs, uh, also coordinating processes. When systems don't have, for instance, if they don't have the same clock, or when some event evaluates, you sort of coordinate between different processes. Uh, and it's important to the number of applications. For my own, for myself, a number of the applications that motivated me to think about hybrid systems were really these uh, groups of vehicles and on cars, roads, and uh, on, on cars, planes, and uh, also UAVs. So let me just sort of read you through why in these three examples this uh, modern hybrid system showed up before I tell, give you a glimpse as to what the theory looks like. In all of these systems, there is uh, a large number of semi autonomous systems. So this picture of the three planes finding formation is supposed to be evocative. They're making use of a common resource, usually space, uh, to achieve a common goal to get from point A to point B in some time without running into each other. If it's cars, they have to do the same thing. They have various modes of operation, uh, modes of operation corresponding to different kinds of flight conditions, different things that they're driving and doing when they're driving, either they're leading this pack or else they're following, and so on and so forth. And what one would like to do is to be able to come up with high-level descriptions of the tasks and design control laws and coordination laws and communication laws to put these systems together. So that, in some ways, the so where all that takes us is that uh, you know it's really a pretty nice way to what we call it. Active systems are sort of put together some of the best parts of control of computer science together. That, Computer science has very rich models of computation, communication models, and of course control theory is pretty rich uh, analysis of the control of individual systems, continuous models, and uh, also of systems driven by differential equations. The applications, so and if one were to make some generalizations, you know, control theory does well with complex continuous dynamics, with simple discrete dynamics, and the opposite, the other side of the spectrum for the methods of theoretical computer science, the applications are in the middle of both pieces of this. So there's been a lot of work, and I, I guess the when we talk about individual papers, and there are a lot of individual papers, I want to put out a, uh, uh, the, the, the work has fallen, I think, roughly speaking, into four areas, modeling and simulation, uh, analysis and verification, the synthesis of controllers, observability and diagnosability of these systems. I think of the areas, observability and diagnosability has been the least explored thus far. And uh, even though I must say the general state of theory has been, uh, is rather rudimentary, if I, can, if I can say so. The applications have made a lot more progress than the state of the theory. Uh, that's, I'm happy to leave these slides, of course, with, uh, uh, with AI. So let me just lead you through a few examples, some of which I think you've, several of you have seen for a fact, so I'll go through this rather quickly. On these uh, automated highway systems, this was the question of increasing the highway throughput and uh, the same highway infrastructure, sending cars through together, making software trains out of cars. Uh, the, the early work by uh, 
Praveen and, and others came up with the notion that if you were to marry in contradictory demands of safety, which is that which requires that cars be far apart and moving slowly, and throughput, which are vehicles are close together and moving fast, is to allow for uh, so about platoons of cars where cars move either together or uh, to move together and in software trains coupled together by software and then the individual trains are separated widely. And that's the concept of platooning. So if you think if you think about this, the implementation of this requires certainly that it's, it's not easy for to uh, it's not easy to do this without some amount of automation. And I think in this uh, wonderful paper in 93, Praveen proposed that uh, a control, control hierarchy very much in the uh, sort of the networking, the network theory, I think very much motivated by, uh, by the networking uh, formulas. And he had these four layers of physical layer, was regulation layer, and coordination layer, link layer, and network layer. So that was really sort of his uh, version of the networking stack. And the hybrid phenomenon really had to do with controllers switching between different maneuvers, different kinds of regulation, lane and maneuver assignment, and also degraded modes of operation. Uh, I had so uh, I had a bit of a film of there, all of this meant, and I'll show it to you right away. severe. 
And that actually causes a bit of a log jam you know, across the, uh, the Atlantic and the Pacific. Uh, even though there's a lot of, uh, a lot of real estate and you know, there's a lot of air, uh, everybody tries to follow the same route because you're trying to optimize the amount of fuel you consume when everybody leaves at roughly the same time, and so traffic tends to branch up. So even though there's a lot of real estate, you know, planes tend to fly uh, close together. Okay, so the general story again here is a very centralized system. If you want to make it a little more efficient, you should allow for a certain amount of decentralization. And uh, it's sometimes jokingly said that there's a lot more computational horsepower behind the cockpit than there is in the cockpit. And the question of why can't you do better has been an issue. Uh, and, you know, the, the, let me just sort of tell you the commercial angle here. The commercial angle here is that in the 777, it costs four, between two and four billion dollars. Again, these numbers are not very public numbers. So it's somewhere between two and four billion dollars to certify the software that flies on the 777. And in fact, on the 787, there are real concerns that the cost of certifying the software will be such that it will make the cost of the aircraft sort of go over the edge. And the reasons that's the case is you've got to sort of guarantee that the software can function in the face of multiple failures and so on and so forth. So local banks and Honeywell have said that uh, you know, the cost of writing one line of code is a million dollars a line. And, and even abandoning a comment statement Lines. And the reason they say this is because if you sort of open up the box and you add a comment statement, you've got to recertify it, and the recertification costs are so high. And there's a rather arcane standard called DO178B, which, and all of this has to do with the fact that this is a handwritten software which is hard to verify. Now, I must say that things are better further along in Europe than they are in the United States. And there is uh, at places like Airbus, there are, they are using certified generators of code that run, runs on board uh, the Airbus system. We aren't there yet, partly because our, our own certification standards don't allow for it, but it's a looming problem. So it isn't just a problem, you know, the first slide had all the Fs, you know, F18, 22, 35, all of that, but it's also true for commercial. Well, yeah? Since you mentioned in Europe uh, there are all these millions uh, Hybrid and military and civil processing that will also be developing tools. Do some of their tools find their way into this Airbus? Uh, yes, Airbus? they have. Yeah. So the tools coming out of uh, Grenoble, especially, and also from uh, Sofia Antipolis, have definitely. So the SCADE Looster is the name of these two tools, which have actually found themselves into design at, uh, at Airbus. And you can see that you know it's it's a whole story. You know it's uh, it's the engine, it's the aircraft, it's the entertainment. It's again the interaction of all of those that's really an issue. Uh, but I think that uh, things are further along, and, uh, and it's all a looming disaster, so to speak. But, and uh, according to me, I mean, so uh, this is going to get a little off track. I mean, my secret desire is, uh, you know, a hundred years ago we decided that. Uh, we had enough of trains in the hub and spoke system and we did personal automobiles. So I think that we probably all get adequately fed up about the hub and spoke system and planes and we should think about personal aviation. So personal aviation, I think, is not such a pie in the sky as one might think because I think that the short work of the short, short work of the landing aircraft are very much things where the, the cost of the engines, you know, even though some of these sound complicated, they're not all that complicated. But the cost of certification of the software is just so expensive and so impossible that that's the biggest thing that stands in the way of Lexus Christ error. Of course, noise and pollution is yet another problem. But that's uh, that be something that we really think about that we do with cars, I guess. But uh, that's something we try to pay attention to. But I think that there is certainly, and certainly there's commercial motion towards thinking about an air taxi service. The company called Eclipse in Arizona that sold 2,000 planes. It sold 2,000 planes without actually producing one yet of these air taxi planes. And, and of course, all of this would get a couple million dollars each. So the price of all of these would go down if it was, uh, it was possible to certify the software on this. Okay, so I will move in the interest of time. So again, here the story is that there's mode switching. If you look at these aircraft, you know there's different modes, level, flight, climb, maintain altitude. 
That's, you know, I think that it's very difficult to reason as x equals fx and the continuous state variables. The a way of controlling the complexity is to think about these different modes of operation to switch between them. Of course, and you start having all these different modes and all of them interacting. Uh, I think in a modern company, and there's just too much going on uh, when you land, when you take off the workload, it's just very, very high to be able to put all these together and to have automated software is really a pretty important one interaction with the air traffic. So especially if you start thinking about this personal aviation, which I think would be a nice stressor for the national airspace system, I think it would be very interesting to have a system which would actually guarantee that uh, people don't run into each other. The vision here would be that the traffic would be more or less automated close to population centers, but then once you're away, you let a person fly a plane with some safeguards that they, uh, you know, people would probably love to fly that plane today like to drive the performance cars. So, uh, here too, if you sort of emulate this, uh, the networking story, the physical layer regulation there, projected planning, tactical planning, and strategic planning, strategic planning, in the sense of how you get from airport one to airport two without, and the big problem here is content detection and resolution. So even though it looks like a lot of airspace, you know, an aircraft is flying 400 or 500 knots, you know, the, the amount of time you have to keep them running to each other is really quite limited, uh, especially if they're flying head on to each other. And they, you know, they, all, they won't have the same clocks, and you really do need to be able to synchronize with each other by exchanging messages. So, the uh, story behind how you try to prove that these things work again needed this uh, version of uh, hybrid systems that I'll tell you about. The last thing I want to tell you is about, uh, again, for the last four or five years, I've been uh, uh, building a bunch of rotorcraft UAVs, uh, just these helicopters, which are automatic. And the kinds of things, I just sort of flip through them quickly. The performance objective is safety, you've got to get everything in the air, and then, then fuel, fault tolerance, or something, some of the individual sensors are actually going to fail how they how stay how to stay in the air, and finally some mission, there's to follow a path, search for an object, a personal evasion game, it's the version of the pre bat version of, uh, uh, I say that with a wonderful description of uh, Krishna's project. So I think uh, the, the story here always has been that there is a degraded mode of operation and a normal mode of operation, each one of them has different modes, but you switch back and forth between these different modes. Uh, envelope protection is to keep these aircraft up in the air, you've got to make sure that they, uh, they maintain certain flight envelopes, vertical speed, horizontal speed, other state variable characteristics, and then, and then you sort of regulate them to do certain minimum cost and minimum fuel kinds of things from them in a normal mode. But uh, when things are degraded, you go into a safe mode where you just try to stay afloat. Okay, so this is a little bit about, uh, I'm just going to show you a few of these sort of baby pictures of the, uh, over the last four or five years, we've uh, enjoyed sort of automating a number of these. They began all as toy helicopters, but they've gradually gotten to be uh, heavier and heavier, and finally, uh, this is the, it's got a 70 pounds of payload, it's really not a toy in any true sense of the word. That's sort of what they all look like. We jokingly call this the Berkeley Air Force. Uh, <laughs> you know, the recent Supreme Court rulings say that we uh, are open to. Uh, and it's a little more about that. I, I think the, the thing that's interesting about this is that it's just a great adversity of uh, other kinds of rotorcraft. I'll show you some of them flying in a second before I dive into the theory. Uh, these are little wings. These are two and a half pound payload and this a one and a half pound motor. This is a uh, dual axis rotorcraft. You know, if you have these counter rotating blades, you don't need a tail on these rotorcraft. They're much more maneuverable. And this is one with uh, tank treads so that you can land and uh, sort of uh, move around. Uh, uh, okay, so. Give you an example of how you might do something with these. Uh, the, one of the things that we did was to coordinate. Uh, so this is a person invasion game where this is one uh, 
one UAV and there's three unmanned ground vehicles down here and they're trying to corral this other ground vehicle. The, this is the invader, the others are all pursuers. It's the, you know, it's a stack of our game, that's the, it's the that's, that's sort of announced its strategy of trying to avoid the others and then the others are trying to corral it. The thing, the, the third dimension, in age, so the initial, none of the locations of any, the, the location of the invader was not known. Then you build a map for it. These are also MATLAB plots showing the a priori. It's all gray, it's the invader is located uh, anywhere in this region. Uh, these uh, cones represent uh, sort of the line of sight of the cameras on board the obstacles. Uh, so the cameras, between the cameras and the camera on the top, enables you to build a map. Um, as the, ma as the map becomes lighter and lighter, it shows you that in t equals 12 seconds, it has ruled out the existence of the uh, evader. In this region, the evader is in this unexplored region for a period of time that gets localized and finally the capture associated with these. So in this particular one, the evader had a speed advantage over the pursuer. And uh, you know, we've actually now run this experiment several times before to just see statistics of what it how the different uh, evader policies influence the capture time and so on and so forth. So that, that in itself is an interesting story, but it's uh, a sideline to what I wanted to say. A related version is for formation flying with uh, a multiple uh, rotorcraft. So this is uh, a formation flying experiment with two real UAVs and seven virtual ones. I'm sitting, I'm sitting, so the, uh, Rather than show you this particular thing, which looks rather boring, I'll show it to you visualized. In, uh, you know, this is the real experimental data driving a simulation. So the notion was those are the two real UAVs, and the leader was asked to uh, follow a square shape in here. And there are two experiments. One is a, a controller which didn't take into advantage, which didn't take into account the information about the leader. That was this one. See, it's a somewhat uh, underdamped version and something which uh, doesn't actually maintain formation. And one where you take into account the media information, which is much a much tighter formation. So this particular one was a so-called mesh stable algorithm. Again, there's mode switching that goes on in addition to all of the other uh, all of the other things that go on with the, the flight. Um, Formation flying, as you can imagine, is you know it's about a primitive version of swarming, undoubtedly, but it's actually useful because the as I was getting folks in the discussion section before the army routinely flies uh, 50 helicopter formations at night, and the way they currently fly things like black boxy is that uh, you know there are two pilots in these uh, in these in these helicopters and they sit side by side, so the pilot on the inside. Is the one that's flying the helicopter because he's keeping track. The other one is three rotary lengths away in the dark. And so then they do their operation. And it's a really quite an exhausting job because after 20 minutes they need to switch out. So as you get the pilots on the outside, become pilots on the inside for them to do the flying. So anything that one can do to sort of reduce those levels of fatigue are actually quite, uh, quite useful. And even though we're not using this mesh stable algorithm, we're using a variant of the model curriculum to do this, it's very much in the spirit of uh, the safe controllers that we talked about. Uh, it was more about landing of the UAV and so on. Okay, so in terms of where I am in the talk, I, this was a little bit about uh, uh, why one should care about hybrid systems. You know, there's kind of applications, and as in a, as in a lot of other subjects, you know, there's always uh, hot-headed engineers who've got problems to solve and uh, dollars to make and things to fly and all of that just marches along. And as you can see, we've actually done a lot of experiments on all these air traffic cosmic pilot systems and uh, uh, UAVs. You take a look at what the kind of theory that's required to make all this work. You take stock of where we are. Uh, life is, uh, you know, is the moment of uh, sobriety, and that's what I want to spend the rest of the talk on. So I want to tell you a little bit about modeling, controller synthesis, a little bit about the analysis of hybrid systems, and uh, I don't think I have time to tell you about uh, 
uh, future work. So just a little more mathematics before we get to the end of the session. So a hybrid system formally is a mathematical object which has a state space which is continuous across discrete, an input space which is continuous across discrete, a vector field which is defined on these, an invariant set, and we subsume the guard and the reset into a single transition relationship, and it's easy to do this, which is a map from X cross V to two Lucari. So unlike, it's not, but right now this deterministic hybrid system is deterministic, but non, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it, it's uh, there's no stochasticity, but the executions are not unique because the reset relationships are all set value. Uh, the, just fishing for the automaton theoretic term, it's uh, non-deterministic. So these are all these non-deterministic systems. The, uh, the probability is not thrown into this. And you really do need to allow for the non-determinism in these processes. So by, what one means by hybrid time trajectory is a finite or infinite execution. These are the switching times. The intervals tau i to tau i prime is where this continuity. The initial state belongs to in it, and so on. Uh, so one, so just to get the criticisms out as I'm doing it, so a lot of people complain that it's not, you know, it's not terribly elegant to have five or seven mathematical objects and you drag them around. And there's a current student of mine called Aaron Ames who thinks that there should be a category, category theoretic way of thinking about this and said maybe it has its friends and detractors, not be more slick, but perhaps less uh, easy to follow. Uh, here's an example of what a hybrid system might look like for two aircraft running, not running into each other, there's more one or two uh, cruising towards each other, mode two, where they're trying to avoid each other, mode three, when they're cruising together, these are what the reset maps look like, this is what the differential equations look like, and these different ones. So Z is the turning angle, uh, X R, Y R, and Psi R is the relative position and heading of the two aircraft. Safety specification is that the aircraft should be D apart. So that's what these uh, hybrid systems look like. So what about uh, controls? So there's two classes of controls, controls and disturbances. Controls are things that you can pick, and disturbances are the things that somebody else picks and you don't know about. And we'll start off with a memory that's controlled in the map from the state space to the space to the power set of the inputs. And a closed loop execution is the question about when these trajectories exist. But, but one thing about these executions, unlike an existence uniqueness theory for differential equations and the existence uniqueness theory for these uh, hybrid systems, I think that we've made halting progress, but I don't think it's completely satisfactory. Uh, and the biggest single conceptual problem has to be what's called Zeno executions, which means that there's an accumulation point of jump times. That means this tau i minus tau i. The time between the two jump points goes to zero as i in a finite time. And that's referred to as the Zeno execution in computer science. And sometimes uh, a special case of this is shows up in control theory as uh, uh, in the context of relaxed controls, sliding mode controls. So, you know, it's, a lot of that is what gets us all, you sweep us all into the framework of the discussion by talking about hybrid systems. So, to give explicit conditions, you know, when you do simulate blocks and you do interconnections, and you'd like the compiler to say, this is a Xeno system, I will not be able to simulate it. And to have these systems sort of look at the graph of the interconnection and do this, that just simply hasn't happened. And I, that, in my mind, is it's unfortunate that we don't have stronger theorems for doing this. So whenever we prove theorems about the existence of controllers, we say, if, unless the execution is Zeno, here is what the controller is, and that, in my mind, that is a serious limitation. Having said that, if you ask yourself, so safety means that you want to keep uh, the state in a certain region, you want to make a certain region invariant. And I think there's a rich tradition of solving this in control theory, so it should come as no surprise this audience that uh, if you ask yourself, can you find the controller so as to render a set W to be controlled invariant, uh, then you call a set controlled invariant if there's a controller such that all executions starting in W say inside W. So you say that you could make the set F uh, say, given a specification of say F, if you're asked to find the controller, if you say you're asked to find the controller that keeps you inside this, you say such a controller exists. If and only if there exists a controlled invariant set W, which contains the initial condition and is contained inside F. 
the small extra thing that one has to do here is that's the gain between the input and the disturbance, and that the disturbance is trying to push you out, and the input is trying to push you in. So that's a zero sum game, it's the simplest kind of game. But once you're done with all this, uh, you have, so again, by the, in terms of why I said control and computer science and I had this symbolic handshake, there's a wonderful history here. There's something called the Church Synthesis of 1953, which did a version of this for discrete systems. And of course, in control theory, this tradition of controllers against disturbances in games, it also an incredibly long history probably going back to about the same time. And so in some ways in hybrid systems, you sort of put those two pieces together. And if you could uh, think about a version of the so-called church synthesis in the language of control theory, this is what it would be like. It says that it, so for the same kind of systems, there is, of course, this game on the graphs. You see other part of it is the church synthesis. So church did explicitly talk about games, but Sure, it wasn't too far off, off from what he did. And certainly for between uh, time systems and non -zero, and zero sum games, there's Isaacs and again, the rich history of persevering games that go into that. So, uh, motivated by that, I wanted to show you sort of how one sort of states in, in, uh, in sort of the sort of union of this uh, theory and computer science theory and control theory is that. Given a set K, if you define its pre sub U, so pre sub U is the predecessor under U, it's the set of states that can be forced to jump to K for some U, and pre sub D of K complement is the state that can jump out of K for some disturbance B, and you call reach KL to be this kind, this, those initial conditions, that those set, those state values that can be driven to K by avoiding L. If you have these three objects that can be defined, if you put together an algorithm, which is certainly the, exactly the same algorithm that goes into invariant set calculations or into the church synthesis, you initialize it with the same set and you cut down the dimensions. The details, perhaps, of exactly what you cut it down by, you do the precursor of the i prime under d, you take the precursor under d of the wi complement, and subtract the uh, so these are the set, set of states for which the control wins the game in the sense of steering you to a safe set while avoiding the unsafe region. And uh, if you sort of subtract that from WI, you think if this algorithm converges, you converge the fixed point of this algorithm is the safe set. And uh, I know I'm going through this a little quickly, uh, and I, perhaps a lack of some loss of precision. Uh, the, the graphical version says that you start off with WI and WI complement. Those are the states for which the disturbance wins the game. The green states are the states for which the control wins the game. And this reach KL was the, the, that, the magenta region, which is all the states for which uh, the disturbance actually pushes you into the bad set while not falling into the good set. So all of this is still the bad set. You add it on to the bad set. You call that to the new WI plus one complement. That's how the key code. So the computational issues now are about if the algorithm terminates, the fixed point is the maximum control invariance. Okay. So the big issues are how to compute all this with games going on, and that's where that's sort of the major battleground of hybrid systems. About what can you done, what can you do, and the issues are the, the for this reach the combination of this predecessors pre sub U and pre sub D. Uh, again, the details are perhaps not as important. They involve a certain kind of quantifier elimination. So it says uh, there exists a new measure for all of these. This uh, transition map lies inside K. So, how, so the way one solves these is by doing quantifier elimination. So for quantifier elimination, there's a there's very interesting theory. The theories, they call theories of the realism logic. Certainly, there is the Tarski Seidenberg set of results, but there are more modern results for doing this. In some ways, how you do pre sub u of k and pre sub d of k are really well known and well understood in the language of the quantifier elimination. This reach kl, on the other hand, needs a, a solution of coupled Hamilton Jacobi equations. Roughly speaking, it's two Hamilton Jacobi equations because one is for the control, the other is for the disturbance. You're trying to, it's, it's, it's like a, it's like, 
you know, in optimal control, if you have optimal control with state constraints, this is like a game with state constraints. And that's why you have a couple of uh, Hamilton of equations. You know, it's the state constraints are not falling into a set and make for two couple of Hamilton Covey equations. And the associated problems also by these Hamilton Covey equations, you get them out, is the loss of smoothness because except for the simplest linear systems, you know, there are uh, key points in this, so one has to interpret these Hamilton-Jacobi equations in the viscosity sense, that's really. And so to get all the details down, it's just like the rest of optimal control, you know, there's a huge amount of work you've got to do to, you know, to justify it. Okay, but even if all of these are computable, because the algorithm does, says only if the algorithm terminates, that is a fixed point. <coughs> so the algorithm is called semi decidable if all of these things, the pre and the reach, are computed. Now, uh, Enziger, a colleague of, former colleague of mine, I should say, proved that there is a definitive boundary between uh, decidability and undecidability in the form of what he called rectangular hybrid automata. So the rectangular hybrid automata were ones where the uh, dynamics were very simple, they were essentially just clocks. Q, x star equals 1. So the problem about this is that the average control theorist is very upset how uh, not rich this uh, is. So These are not the classic dynamics that uh, people can warm up to in a control theoretic audience. So the question arises as to what you can do when the systems are not uh, decidable. And I must say there's you know, so a little bit about how you can apply this to the Path example, so I have a little bit of theorem about this, but in the interest of time, I'll just move along. There is, on the other hand, this, this question of what you can do about the, if it's not decidable with sort of sophisticated Hamilton Jacobi equations, even though you can't compute them, these level set methods, which are beginning to be popular, are now actually the kinds of things which do enable you to compute approximations of the real sets. So here's a student of uh, Claire's called. Uh, Ian Mitchell, who's now at UBC, who's generated these level set tools for being able to compute these reach sets using level set methods. And they actually compute the approximations of the uh, reach sets. And this is sort of what the reach avoid set, I guess, for the obstacle avoidance between two aircraft looks like. And either, everything down to the visualization software and stuff that you can download. You know, it's a Hamilton Jacobi equation, but it's got a max, min stuff, it's got a min zero. So, you know, all of these, each one of these max and the min introduces little kinks into the Hamilton Jacobi equation, which are fine in terms of provided one really understands uh, solutions of this to be solutions in the viscosity <coughs> sense. And uh, as you some of you know, I think this audience might know a lot about this. So the question about getting the, uh, uh, whether these things are non-anticipative or, or, uh, or not control laws which are non-anticipative in these games is always a pretty non-trivial venture. And some of these recent papers have been really to establish the existence of solutions. So I will, in the next two minutes, can I take two minutes? I just want to tell you a little bit of I want to shift there is to just tell you sort of the conceptual mathematics of what goes into these Hamilton Jacobi equations. And to do that, I'll just think of all of these systems as being uh, so called transition systems. So I won't worry about uh, continuous and discrete. I'll just say this is an infinite dimensional state space. Sigma is a letter of symbols standing for transitions. That's the transition symbol in Q0 and QF are initial state and final state. So the whole search in decidability is to try to understand if you can take these reachability problems and find equivalents, is find finite partitions of the state space. So things which are decidable somehow have to be finite types. So the questions about how you make these things finite is really to try to find partitions for this. And the way one finds partitions is to find equivalence classes which behave the same way. And all of these operators, pre sub u and pre sub d, etc., are predecessor operators. And what you have to do is to isolate those classes of systems which are rendered in bed. So, how does one do that systematically? So, these things are called, uh, if you have a transition relationship, you say two blocks are called 
So a partition, which is given by a tilde of the stage space, is called a bisimulation. If uh, it's a bisimulation, it's a simulation in both directions. And roughly speaking, it says that uh, you can partition the system into uh, one, you know, one, two, three, four for each one of these blocks. And transitions among these blocks can be captured by the equivalence relationship that is induced by the transition relationship. So the whole notion of when things are decidable or approximations for decidability boils down to whether there exist finite by simulations of the state space under the appropriate solutions. And this algorithm that I showed you, the conditions under which it terminates are exactly the conditions under which these transition relationships are finite by simulation. So in turn, how does one do that? Uh, let me sort of flip through this. The story is that decidability requires this by simulation algorithm to be to terminate in a finite number of steps. And for it to be computable, you need to represent set, set symbolically perform Boolean operation in sets, which is easy, and be able to compute the pre sub p of the set. In order to do that, the classes of sets and the classes of vector fields must be topologically simple. So how does one understand this? Well, recently in the mathematical logic, there has been a notion of what are called decidable theories of the reals. So uh, a theory of the reals is one in which you can write multiple formulas. So I actually won't drag you through all of these mathematics. I'll just sort of say this in words here. So the conceptual difference that happened was that quantified elimination was something that sort of slowed down in, nine, in the late 50s starts in Seidenberg. And in those, so the theory of the reals that they used was one where formulas were used only by these operators less than, plus, multiply, and constants were ones that you got by adding, multiplying 0, 1, 2, 3, so it's natural numbers, basically. And quantified elimination just enabled you to be able to take formulas like the second formula that you said and be able to if there exists w such that x w squared plus y w plus z is equal to zero, is equivalent by just looking at the radicals to y squared minus 4x z greater than equal to zero. And to do those, do so systematically, it's, it's easy to do this systematically. And that's what the Starsky Seidenberg algorithm does. There's tools that you can get called red log and cut You know, they're like maxima and stuff like that. They're not. They spend all that time in garbage collecting if you give them too many variables. Please conceptually, they'll do, uh, they'll, they can do quantified elimination. Now, 